Welcome to the podcast, Entrepreneur Perspectives, Building and Protecting Your Business One Podcast at a Time, a Kessource Family Production. In this episode, we discuss managing your downtime, the future of baseball and analytics. Our guest today is Dean Jackson. Dean is a minor league baseball player, most recently in the Arizona Diamondbacks organization. Due to an elbow injury, Dean is working his way back to the diamond and is currently rehabbing and handling baseball analytics for Arizona Christian University. You will hear Dean and I discuss these five topics, the emotional roller coaster ride of playing professional baseball, the future of baseball, analytics, and doing the work while you are working. And then get ready for a wave of rapid fire questions. All right, let's bring Dean Jackson to the mound. Dean, welcome to the Entrepreneur Perspectives Podcast. It's awesome to have you. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for bringing me on. Absolutely. So tell us about your journey from the baseball field to where you are now. Um, so for most of my life, um, I thought I was dead set on being a, uh, a professional baseball player and playing in the big leagues. And uh, so I went through high school, college, ended up getting drafted after college, uh, played with the Diamondbacks uh, for a season. I uh, did really well in, in the minor league system, uh, but unfortunately that off season, I ended up getting hurt. Um, and uh, shortly after that, uh, because the teams don't want to pay you when you're hurt, uh, I was released. And so now I'm doing uh, baseball analytics, at my alma mater, uh, Arizona Christian University. And I am also uh, trying to get healthy and get back on the field. So is there a loophole in the contract that, allowed for them to release you and not pay you yeah so it's uh it's okay so it, you kind of have to understand how minor leaguers are paid uh, minor leaguers are paid only in season um so they're not paid for spring training spring training is technically optional uh but if you don't show up uh good luck getting right that right yeah. Um, yeah um so uh you're not paid during spring training. Uh, and then when you start the season, that's when you're started to be paid. So you're not paid during the off season. Um, they have this whole thing structured. Uh, there, you're also paid as a minor leaguer very little. Um, the standard is about $1,100 a month uh, before taxes, only in season. Um, so how they get away with that is they just kind of structure it as basically an internship is what they call it. Um, so for me, when I, when I was hurt in the off season, um, it's kind of a, essentially, yeah, a loophole where, uh, you can be released because normally you're not supposed to be able to be released if you get hurt with the team, they have to make you healthy again. And that's just to, to save the players, you know, so the team's not just running through players, uh, getting them hurt and then releasing them. Um, so, uh, yeah, because I was hurt in the off season, uh, that's a tiny little thing that most people in the know are like, wait a minute, you can't be released when you're hurt, but you actually can uh, when you get hurt in the off season. Yeah, I mean, it's just in business in general, um, and, and that's what it is, right? And you're playing professional sports, and it's a business, and mm -hmm. contracts exist. And, and it's, it's amazing to us, a lot of times people don't understand that the contracts that they signed, you know, what it can do for them. And I'm not saying that you didn't understand that, or just in baseball in general, it is, there's just so much fine print that's going on, and it's so important to have people in the know that can help you with it. But, and sometimes, like you say, it's just an unfortunate situation where you get hurt at the wrong time and the team can kind of take advantage of that. So that happens, and, and we'll get more into this, but if you were to come back and play, are you at that point essentially a free agent and any team can sign you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my path back into playing uh, because I've been out now for over a season uh, with this elbow injury, um, my path is I kind of have to prove to teams that I'm healthy. Um, so there's a lot of uh, like independent baseball leagues that they're called. Uh, there's like two or three top leagues that guys get signed into uh, what they're called affiliate teams. And that's like the normal 30 that you know in Major League Baseball. Um, so they usually will pick guys from those independent leagues. Uh, and bring them on so that for me basically I have to prove to a team that I'm healthy and that I'm who I was and things like that and the way for me to do that is to go through independent 
and then uh, get back with an affiliated team. Yeah, so it's changed a lot, right? Because there's so much information, and you know, you like you see college recruits of all sports, and there's a, the game tape, right? So they can review, watch your tape on YouTube, for example, or mm-hmm. there's different huddle websites for football. I know, and I'm not sure. I'm sure baseball's got similar ones, but are there other you know, unique ways to be found out? Or is it just, is, is that like really just throwing uh, darts from miles away? <laughs> well, honestly, so uh, how, so a few years ago, maybe when I was in high school, uh, which would have been, gosh, I don't know, only six, seven years ago, um, the standard was you had to be seen by a scout, right? A scout had to find you Someone in the know had to tell a scout for them then to know, and then they had to come out and watch you play and all this different stuff. However, the direction that the game is taking, uh, which I assume it just like, pretty much goes along the lines of the way everything else is taking in business, um, is it's super, super online now. And very, very, it's so much easier to be found as a player now. Um, so, for example, I could throw a bullpen in my backyard set up with a radar gun uh, and set up with a a video camera and uh, get all of my pitches movements, uh, all the fastball velocities, all the velocities of every pitch. And there's technology where you can actually measure the break of the pitch and things like that. And then I have contact information for pretty much all the scouts in my area for all the teams. I can just send it off. Like none of them have to come and see me. I can simply just take a good video with all the information that I know they want to see and send it off, boom, in in one little thing. So no one has to come out and spend their time. No one has to spend time traveling. No one has to work with schedules. None of that. It's uh, So that's kind of how baseball is turning. It's much more along the lines of uh, knowing what scouts want and getting it out through social media channels uh, to them. So it's becoming much easier. It's a streamlined process. I mean, you see it in every industry. Um, As we've talked about before, uh, one of our businesses that we have is an insurance industry. Insurance business and in insurance, you know, people don't want to go out and take an exam. They don't want someone to come see them. They don't want to fill out paperwork. So what they've done is it's all streamlined. It's all streamlined, and you apply online. No one ever comes and sees you. They run the analytics behind the scenes. They have all your data, and then they make a decision. And now, you know, it's not all the way there yet, but it's going that direction. And like you said, acquiring new business, having conversations with people. Like, for example, you and I talking today. You talked with John uh, in our group, and you and John met on Instagram. And so it's, mm-hmm. it's like you just said, it's all online now, and it's, it's amazing that it's taken to professional baseball as well. So is that one of the ways that you're – trying to uh, make your comeback is by doing exactly what you just said? Um, Well, I think it just provides an extra opportunity. Um, So a lot of guys before, uh, when you get seen by a scout, it's like there's only one day that you have to impress this guy. Because how scouting works, um, there's different areas of the country, usually a few different states, um, and a scout for a team will have, basically, that's his area. He's called an area scout. So uh, in the area of the country that I am, I'm in, I'm in Arizona. So it's Arizona, Colorado, California, and New Mexico. And each team has basically one guy who goes around and sees everyone in that area. So as you can imagine, that's a lot of people that this guy has (laughs) to go see, right? (laughs) That's a huge amount of people. So that includes uh, college players. That includes high school players. Like that's a lot of players. So for you as a, a player trying to get seen, you got one shot basically to get this uh, to get this guy to like you. So if you have a bad day, you're kind of screwed. Yeah. Um, but how it's turned now is is you can have a bad day, and the scout will be like, "Well, just follow up with me. You know, this is the information I'm looking for, and take a video and uh, yeah. make sure I see it. You know, to have him make a better decision." So for me, uh, I'm kind of using both channels. I'm kind of a guy who uh, who steps up when things get when things get very. Uh, the high high amount of pressure and uh, the stakes are very high. I usually perform at my best. Okay. So that's not usually my uh, that's not usually my problem is is missing the the day when the scouts come out to see me. But if I do, uh, there's always that potential to just uh, send sure. all the information that they want out to them. Right. Yeah. It- and like you said, uh, it, it's just another, and we talk about this all the time, it, you know, people are like, well, I don't want to work in social media. I don't want, I don't think I, this is going to help me. And, and yeah, you can't, it's not going to replace everything that you've ever done. It's just another tool. That's what it is. Like you being able to send that to a scout in that's in Colorado and you're in Arizona, it's just another tool for him to now see you 
and make some sort of connection with. And I agree Absolutely. with that. And, and that's amazing. And but, but at the same point, now more people have the opportunity to send that same type of information. So he's getting flooded with, you know, whether it's emails or messages of, of stuff to watch. It's a, it's a, it, it probably helps the scout in many ways, but also makes them even more busy than they ever have been because oh, so much information has got to be coming at them. <laughs> absolutely. So get into this a little bit from what I understand. Well, you tell me, tell me like what kind of pitcher are you? Are you a power pitcher? Like what, what do you, what's that all about? <laughs> so uh, in, let's see, in high school and in college, um, I was a starter. So basically what happens uh, when you're the best pitcher on your team is the team tries to get you to throw the most amount of innings, right? Yeah. So how you yeah. do that is you're a starter. Yeah. Um, however, when I got the pro ball, um, I was actually, so I wasn't selected in the draft. I was taken as a free agent after the draft. Um, they, with, I went to a small NAIA school, and so it's hard for scouts to really understand how good you are because the players that you're playing against are not as good, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yep. Um, like the big D1s, you're playing against the best of the best, so it's very easy to tell how good a player is. But you don't really know how good an NAIA player is because they're playing against lower competition. Right. So usually what happens to guys in the NAIA is you get selected much lower because there's a higher risk uh, involved with it. So for me, I was selected basically at the very end. Um, and so what that means for my position with the Diamondback is I was essentially the last guy. So um, the guy who's not going to throw a lot of innings and the guy who um, – basically the last guy out of the bullpen. So if we're getting our butt kicked, that was my job was to come in and basically stop the bleeding kind of and just get us through the game. Mm -hmm. Um, However, uh, when I got in, uh, I performed significantly higher than what they expected. Um, And by the end of the season, I was actually the closer uh, for our team. So I had gone from the last guy out of the bullpen to the guy we want in the game at a high pressure situation to win it for us. So that ended up being my job, which was great. Um, in terms of what type of pitcher, um, I kind of I feed off that energy. You know, I, I feed off just high pressure situations. Um, I'm usually between 90 to 93 fastball velocity, uh, big curveball, and uh, sometimes I'll throw a, a slider or a splitter. But generally, uh, fastball curveball type guy. Okay. Uh, real high intensity on the mound. Real high effort. Uh, if you're sitting close enough to the field, you'll uh, hear me grunting when I'm throwing and making <laughs> yeah. noise. Yeah, it's, it's a good time. It's so fun. you're, like fun, yeah, you're one out, of those so. pitchers. A lot of pitchers, you know, can be boring to watch, but a lot of pitchers have that, like you're saying, that energy. It's like you watch, if you compare it to golf, like you watch a golfer make a great play and it's like he's done it a million times and it's like it, 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 there's no excitement at all to it. You're like, man, just get excited a little bit. You, see, you probably yeah. have that energy that goes with it. Now, and you just said you threw it like 90, 93, 94 miles per hour. Is that considered fast in baseball today? No, not at all. No. Um, actually, the average, uh, so for the past 20 years, the average MLB fastball has continued to climb every single year. Um, and uh, it is now, gosh, I'm pretty sure it's 92.8 or something like that is the average fastball uh, in the big league. So I actually throw below average velocity. My average tackle is about 91, somewhere in there, 91 and a half. Uh, so I'm a tick and a half below the average. Okay. Um, and all that really is, I mean, only the only thing fastball velocity does for you is uh, just gives the hitter less time to decipher what pitch is coming. Like uh, all pitching, like if you think about what pitching is, all pitching is, is I'm going to throw you a pitch. And you're not going to know what it is, so you got to figure out what it is, and then you got to figure out where it's going, and then you got to hit it hard, right? So if I can decrease the amount of time that you have as a hitter to figure out what pitch is coming or where it's going, if I can just decrease that amount of time, you're going to make worse decisions because you have less time to think about it. So it's really all fastball velocity does for you, yeah. Um, but it helps a lot. I mean, it's when you actually look at. What is the difference between a 92 and a 95 mile an hour fastball? Like, if you were sitting there, I guarantee you, you couldn't tell. Right. Um, but that extra, that tiny little bit of time that it takes away, that starts to make a massive amount of difference. Basically, right at about 92, you're at the peaking, like, you're at the breaking point, essentially. Anything more, and you're, uh, the amount of time that the hitter has just starts drastically uh, reducing. 
uh, compared to what they actually need to be successful. That's okay. what Ralph Apple actually does for you. And so you're getting into the analytics aspect of it. So like, it, you know, back in the day, not like that long ago, like you're saying, this has increased uh, the, the average speed, but it seems like it's so much about how fast can you throw. And like, I knew that answer, like, cause they would say like, well, if you can throw 97, 98, now you got a chance now you got a, now you got a spot in the major leagues or, you know, close to a hundred. And it seems, it seems almost like it's going so fast. Like where does this take the future of baseball? I mean, you're talking about the analytics side of it. I mean, first of all, you have injuries. I'm not sure was your injury related to throwing the ball and, and throwing too much or yeah. speed. And then, was it like where are we going from here? Like how fast is too fast? Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, as, I mean, if any of you, if any of the people listening to this have watched uh, Major League Baseball over the past five years, they will definitely tell you that it has started to change into a it's a thrower's game. It's it's very less of a pitcher's game now, if that makes sense. Yep. It's very more about. Um, you know, it's much more about how hard can you throw and how nasty is your stuff in terms of like how good are your off speed pitches, how much do they move, things like that. Um, if you look at any uh, major league bullpen, like this year in the uh, in the playoffs, every single guy that's being rolled out there is ninety five to one hundred out of the bullpen. Yeah, like, it's, it's unbelievable uh, what's being accomplished in terms of just athletic performance by these guys. Um, and ultimately, it's just because. Hitting 100 is really freaking hard. It is much harder than hitting 92. Um, So uh, while a lot of people don't like that the game is shifting into kind of more of a powers game, especially with hitters too, guys are just trying to hit homers, uh, it becomes less about the strategy of the game. But ultimately that's what the analytics has shown, is that power plays uh, on both sides of the ball. It plays as a pitcher and it plays as a hitter. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how the game is shifting is, is more towards power. And yeah. you hit on a great point where it definitely does increase the injury rate. Um, the harder you throw, the more energy you've got going through, the more stress you have going through in uh, different joints. And if you are not the, – the thing, the, the common misconception with injuries is that people think that just by throwing that hard, you're going to get hurt. That's not necessarily the case. What happens is when you couple that along with – oh, hey, last night we got in at 4 a.m. from our road trip, and today we had an afternoon game that we had to be at the park at a certain time by. And, oh, by the way, I didn't have enough time to get breakfast or lunch, so I didn't get any sleep last night, and I didn't have any food today. Oh, and by the way, I um, I threw the past two days. You know, So then you go out yeah. and throw again, right. and your body's not performing well, and you put all that energy through it, and it breaks. So, but throwing harder, that's, that's essentially what happens when guys get hurt. Is there some they, they don't get hurt when they're performing at their best and when everything's feeling great. They perform or they get hurt when uh, something's breaking down and there's a, there's a reason why something is breaking down. If that makes sense. Yeah. But uh, obviously, the harder you throw, the more uh, potential you have for one of those things to happen. Yeah. So, and so with your injury specifically, what happened? Um, I was playing long toss. Um, so for me, uh, well, for people who don't know what long toss is, uh, you essentially it's a, a form of warming up and an arm workout where you start pretty close to your throwing partner. You throw a little bit. You take it back a little further, take it back a little further until you're throwing basically at, at max distance at, as far as you can throw. Um, and that's a, a, a normal throwing workout. Obviously, you get better at throwing just like anything else. You get better at throwing, you have to throw. You get better at throwing hard, you have to throw hard. Uh, and I've been, I mean, everybody trains like this. I've been training like this since I was 16. Uh, just happened that one throw, everything kind of went weird and uh, ended up hurting my elbow. Um, but ultimately for me, uh, it's things that I had to be doing uh, because I don't throw hard enough, you know. So I kind of have to toe the line of what's safe and what's not safe uh, because if I don't, I can't compete in the industry. So right. it's just kind of the way it is. comes with yeah. the job. Yeah, it comes with it. So this injury that you're coming back from now, is this an, this isn't, I mean, it's an injury. It, it, it caused you to have to kind of take a step back. Is this an injury though, that people can come back from? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, the main thing that you hear with pitchers elbows is Tommy John surgery. Right. Uh, that's when, uh, there's a ligament called the ulnar collateral ligament. Uh, UCL is what people refer to it a lot. Uh, that's in the elbow. 
it basically just stabilizes the elbow. Uh, when you throw, you go through a lot of stress, or the UCL goes through a lot of stress. Uh, so if it's not there, basically your elbow joint just starts bouncing around and things get hurt, and it's not very uh, not very comfortable. Right. So okay. uh, all, all Tommy John surgery is is you broke that ligament, so you need to replace it. Um, for mine, um, there's actually a, a relatively new procedure. Sometime in the last 10 years is what it started. Um, my UCL didn't break. It just peeled off of the contact points of each bone, if that makes sense. So I had a fully intact UCL just kind of floating in my elbow. Uh, so they went in for mine, and they just uh, braced it up, and they put it back. Okay. Um, so it's, it's about a three times faster uh, recovery rate than having a full reconstruction. Uh, so for me, I, I didn't quite get the, the full TJ. Uh, but Tommy John at this point is, uh, gosh, like an 80 to 85% recovery rate. Uh, the surgery that I had is higher than that. Uh, so while it takes a while to come back from, it's definitely not uncommon for people to come back perfectly fine from it. Okay. So when, when would you anticipate being at it, close to 100%? Um, somewhere between six and eight months from today. From, from today. That time. Okay. Yep. Okay. That's excellent. So you're, uh, so it'd be like, and next season would be it. We'd be looking for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I could be playing winter ball, but, uh, that doesn't, it, there's a whole bunch of different seasons uh, for baseball with a bunch of different organizations and you can play year round professionally if you want to. Okay. Um, so I'll probably try and get on basically whenever I'm, I'm healthy and I feel like I'm ready to go. And like I'm at a place where affiliate teams want to sign me, I'll try and jump in with one of the leagues at, at some of the, at some capacity and uh, get going on that. Yeah. So whatever that is, I mean, obviously when you go through injuries, some things change. So sure, uh, I find out. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Uh, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's quite a ride. Um, with this like roller coaster ride that you're on of the ups and the downs and, and being in professional baseball and, and getting hurt and kind of working your way through it. I mean, what would you tell someone else who's, it, it might have nothing to do with baseball, just in life and business and any of those things, like you've seen it, like you're a young guy and you've seen a lot. What would you tell someone else going through this situation? Um, honestly, so it's, it's kind of been sweet um, because Obviously, you don't want to be fired from the job that you're on. Like, I didn't want to be released. Like, that sucks. You know, I wanted to stay with the D-backs and continue to climb. Uh, but for me, um, especially because I was cut in college as well, one of the colleges that I went to, and I had this big injury in college. So I'm, I'm not a stranger to seeing things go one way and then having them just crash down in front of me. Um, but I think what it's done is kind of made me better in the long term, if that makes sense. Like, Mentally, I feel so much more prepared to handle the ups and downs of things. And uh, I'm obviously I'm pretty young. I mean, I'm 23. I'm almost 24. Um, but I've noticed that, uh, especially in, in my life and in my family's lives and um, everybody that I know, things aren't moved very often. Uh, they like to go up and down a whole lot. Uh, so for me, having these massive just inconveniences, I guess, and, and very large changes of what I thought was going to happen uh, has kind of made me better in the long run of handling this stuff. Um, so while it sucks at the beginning, let's get laid off, uh, or for me, you get fired, and uh, you don't really know what to do with it, going forward, I feel like mentally, it's just, it just makes me better at, at what I'm trying to do. Uh, it's it's hard to, I, I feel like I'm not explaining it very well. It's so hard to explain. No, I, I think you so are much. actually. Yeah, no, I mean, I, it, there's so much, like you said, there's so much that goes into it. And we, we had a, we did an interview with a sports psychologist who actually lives in Charleston, South Carolina. And he talks about like recognizing, allowing yourself to recognize the fact that this does suck. This is, you, you're allowed to be mad. And, you know, he was talking about golf, for example, like if you three putted the green before and then you get to the next green and you're like, now you're all mad and you're, you just, you, you can't do it. And you have to recognize the fact that something bad just happened and it's okay to be upset. And then you got to clear your mind and move forward and then find the positive, right? And, and maybe not in the golf situation, but what you're doing is finding the positive. And yeah, uh, just, just today I found out someone we'd worked with for 10 years at a very large company just got laid off. This person has actually worked at that company for 17 years. And this person and four other people were laid off from the company. And you have to kind of like, wow, you get, it's like a kick to the gut and it's not good. It sucks. And you, what are you going to do about it? I mean, some years ago, I remember uh, coming back from a vacation 
and I had these weird voicemails on my phone and I looked at um, my wife uh, who we married and I'm like I think my division of my company just got shut down and she's like what are you talking about I was like I don't know I just got these weird voicemails so I went in the next day and sure enough there's security waiting for me because they had laid everybody off on Friday but I was I was out of town that weekend and so when I came back Monday security escorted me to my desk didn't let me get on my computer and said you can grab your personal belongings and leave and everyone was gone. It was it was crickets in there. Wow. And it was just like, wow, like just like that, you're gone. And you didn't have control over that because it was like everyone from the president to the admin to anyone in admin was gone from the company. And this stuff happens and recognizing it and like you like you're doing, like you're seeing the positive, it's gonna make you better in the long run. Uh, I believe that. I mean, I really do. I've lived it and I continue to see it. And there are no guarantees. You know, we talk to people when they come and want to work for us. They said, well, we want to guarantee this or guarantee that. I'm like, there there are no guarantees. You know, this, things can yeah. change, especially now. The rate of change, like you just talked about in baseball, the whole game of baseball is changing. And it's it's only going to change even faster, right? And something could happen. You, you never know. Like Major League Baseball could go bankrupt. I'm not saying it will, but things can happen to where your platform doesn't exist anymore. Um, yep. And it, it's kind of amazing to watch it unfold. But like at the same time, for you, it might be like this huge positive because we've seen it before where like think of a quarterback who comes in from college football to the NFL and they sit and they watch and they want to play but they or they get injured let's say and they have to sit back and they have to learn other aspects of the game you sound we've talked to baseball players before but you seem to have this understanding of the game that not everybody has and i don't know if you've if you've maybe some people just study the game is that because of you studying the game but is it also because like i understand it you're doing analytics for arizona christian university you understand the game of baseball where it is where it is and where it's going maybe because of this setback more do you do you see any tie-ins there yeah absolutely um i think the biggest reason why i got into analytics was because i wanted to play in the big leagues and no one could tell me how um, so after a little while, I got really frustrated and asking everyone, well, how do you play in the big leagues? And they had no answer for me. So I set off to figure it out on my own. Um, and, uh, found a bunch of websites, found a bunch of, uh, analytical people online, uh, who are willing to talk different points with me and, and walk me through different things. And, uh, I started to realize, holy cow, like there's just like anything else, there's a system to this. Like there's a certain person that our pro scouts are looking for. There's a certain way that these guys, uh, basically pitch off of their strengths and uh, use it to win games. Like there's, there's a certain way that they do this stuff. And it's interesting to notice uh, when they miss or when they get off of their plan or, or what they do well, they don't succeed as well anymore. So basically all analytics is is just uh, it's, it's information. It's just data. And then uh, obviously with, it, with analytics, though, there's a ridiculous amount of it. And you just have to decide what's important and how do I use it. That's literally it. And I'm, um, I mean, my dad was a, uh, still is an entrepreneur. Uh, my mom worked in software development um, from the 90s all until today. Um, so I come from a family of people who try to figure it out, you know. So uh, for me, going into analytics was very, I mean, it, it's almost like it was genetic because I come from people who just try and figure it out. And that's, that's what I tried to do with baseball is how the heck am I going to be a big leaguer? I got to figure this thing out. And uh, it's, grown and grown and grown and uh yeah. it's been very valuable yeah yeah i mean if you never throw the ball 97 miles an hour you might have something else going for you that you can use to your advantage it's smart i mean you're you know you're training right rehabbing doing all that kind of stuff so you're working towards your playing career but i see you as you're wor so you're working while you're working right like you have two different mm -hmm. things going on at the same time and they both feed off of each other it's very aligned as to what what you have going on and we always look for you know business owners that we want to work with that have this type of alignment in their lives um, because it's just a lot of good things come come from it. Like maybe you never become, maybe you never get back into playing baseball. I'm not saying that's going to happen, right? But but you yeah, have but these the other th yeah. yeah these other things you have going for yourself. It was funny. I was listening to a podcast. I think it's like an NBA Woj podcast. And he, what's cool about this one is it's not about necessarily the game a little bit, but it's more about like stories behind the game. And he was interviewing Jalen okay. Rose, who played at Michigan. He had a long career at ESPN now. And apparently he studied communications at school 
And they said, well, how is it so seamless for you from going to the NBA and the second your career in the NBA ended, you were broadcasting, right? You were doing shows, you were doing play-by-play. He's like, when they, he was on the Chicago Bulls and they lost, they won nine games this year. I think this like 2007, I think this is right or something like that. And what happened was when he was out, he wanted to start broadcasting. So he was out and the NBA finals was going on and he went to some station. And he said, can I help you guys broadcast? And so he started creating content for himself. And so he did this every single year for the rest of his career. And by the time he retired, ESPN comes to him and says, we want to hire you. So he was yeah. do, still playing his career, but he was working on his next career. And never knowing mm-hmm. when that NBA career would end, it's seen. I mean, it's all different, and everyone's got different things and interests and passions that they're that, that that's going for them. But it sounds a lot like you. Like you could become a general manager, you could be the head of analytics for the Texas Rangers, right? Like it's wide open. Absolutely, yeah. The the analytical work that I do in uh, in my time in college and in my time playing professionally um, has only helped me. And built a foundation for the analytical work that I'm doing right now uh, with Arizona Christian. Uh, and it's interesting finding uh, when you find more things, you know, you, you don't find things every single day, but when you make new realizations, maybe monthly or, or twice a month or once every two months or something like that, it starts to open up new doors and you start to read it like your eyes start to open. You're like, holy cow, like I can, I can, um, uh, what's it, I can uh, apply this when I'm playing, you know, or when I find something when I'm playing, be like, well, I can't use this, but I know somebody, uh, a specific person in Arizona Christian, this would fit perfectly for them. You know, so there's so much overlap uh, in that. Um, and I think it's really important because honestly, for me, like, yeah, I, if you were to ask me where I play in the big leagues, I think the answer is yes. I think I'll do it. Whether I will or not, who has been, no one knows, you know, right, but right. I think I'm going to do it. But ultimately, at some point, I'm going to be done. You know, I'm going to be done with, with playing. And it's not like I'm going to use all this time that I spent towards uh, playing baseball. It's not like that's just in and of itself. That's only for baseball. That's not preparing me for anything else in my life. You know, so I feel like um, this, hopefully this uh, career after baseball in analytics or in helping the team uh, be successful, which is really all analytics is, is just helping the team be successful. Um, it's, it's all preparing me for down the line, whether I continue to play, whether I play till I'm 45 in the big leagues or not, you know, whether I, uh, whether my hip blows up again or, or my elbow blows up again, or something ridiculous happens, you know, all this is preparing me for a few different routes. Um, and, uh, I feel really prepared for it. So yeah, yeah no, absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's absolutely right. And I would just agree with you because I had people telling me that and you're like, well, this setback here is going to serve you in the future. And you're like, that's crazy. You know, especially when you're young, you're like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. This is terrible. I hate it. Right. But you do realize that when mm-hmm. you get going, it's like my father telling me these things or other people or other mentors that you have. And then you, like you said, then you start realizing that the things, the negative things, the failures, those are the things that actually are grow you even more than any of the successes. And it sounds like very cliche-ish and you, you read about it, but it's true. It's, but it's more true when you actually live it. Like you actually have to go through it. Uh, you can't, I mean, you can read about it because you can read about others. You know, you talked about entrepreneurship, like that's what we're big into. You can read about Steve Jobs and all the trials and tribulations that he went through or Phil Knight, the founder of Nike. You can read their books and their stories about how there was moments where they were like seconds or minutes ago, uh, from going out of business completely. And Nike would never mm-hmm. have existed if it wasn't for that. So like, but, if the, but more than anything is when you live it is when you can really understand it like you're doing and you're doing it at a young age. So it's, so it's pretty awesome. So on one other side of it, on the analytics. So I'm watching, I think it was the Yankees and the Twins are playing in the wild card game, right? And I think I turned on the okay. TV and it was like maybe five to nothing already. And this, is, this was happening in baseball beforehand, but like the analytics take over. And you're unloading your roster, right? You're unloading your pitching staff and all that kind of stuff. And there's so many analytics that are going on. And a lot of people are like you said, it could be ruining the game of baseball. But like the second they, the analytics say, get this pitcher out of the game, and the, and the manager might not even have a say anymore in baseball, right? Like the analytics team said, he's out, get him out of there. Like, <laughs> is that just like the the the... The, the side, the two sides that we have going on where some people are like, no, 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 I want to go with my gut feeling. I know this guy and he's going to make the right throw right now. Or is it, are we going to the science of it? Like, how do you, obviously you're an analytics guy, but you're also a pitcher. And what if the analytics say, nope, get Dean out of there? So um, the role in today's uh, professional baseball game 
uh, is to marry his knowledge of the game from a, I almost want to say from a traditional baseball side, what he's learned from his career as a manager and from as a player and things like that. It's to marry that with the data that he's being given from the analytics team. So ultimately it's like a, it's like a half and half type thing. Um, so, uh, it's not like the analytics is taking over and it, it totally takes over. Like that's not what it is. Um, and ultimately when you think about what analytics is, like if you're a pitcher, let's say you're throwing against like, let's say Barry Bonds, for example, you're throwing against Barry Bonds. He obviously doesn't play anymore, but let's say he was, because everyone knows who he is. Let's say you try, you get Barry Bonds to a two strike count. You're trying to strike him out. So you go to your strikeout pitch. Let's say it's a slider down or something like that, down out of the zone. You're trying to make him think it's a fastball, but it's actually a slider. Let's say he hits it for a homer, right? So now the next time you face Barry Bonds, you know that you tried to strike him out on a slider down and he hit it for a homer. So that's probably not going to work, right? All analytics is, is just getting more of those. Inst- like you, you as a pitcher right there, you're using analytics. You're using data that you have available to you to, under- to make a decision of, I'm not going to throw Barry Bonds this slider down. All analytics is doing is doing that on a grander scale. Like you as a player cannot experience every single pitch that happens and remember specifically, just like you can remember as specifically as that Barry Bonds incident, you can't remember it, all those. You, you don't have access to see every single pitch that a hitter has seen for this entire season. However, uh, when you keep track of it, all analytics is is just taking that information and writing it down. And then once you write it down, uh, you find different ways to manipulate uh, the stuff that you have written down to tell you different things that you want to know. That's really it. Um, so it, let's say if I was looking at Barry Bell, instead of, looking at just that one at bat will Barry Bonds hit that slider out. Now I can look at every at bat and be like, oh wow, you know, maybe you come to a different conclusion. Maybe you see, oh wow, when Barry Bonds is set up a certain way with these pitches in front of that slider down, he swings and miss at it every time. But when I set it up the way that I did, he hit it out every single time. You know, then you start to realize these things, you start to see things and uh, it gives you a much better insight into what decision you're going to do. And ultimately, yeah. as a player, uh, you can also, you can just say, screw it, man, I'm not going to go with that. You know, I'm going to go with what I want, what I want, you know, what, what, what my best stuff is. I don't care what the analytics says. And you can either succeed or fail. But ultimately, from that, you now have a data point of going off what the analytics says and what happened. Like, the whole thing is just data and analytics. Yeah. People don't realize that it is, but it is. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great way to explain it. It's a very simplistic way of looking at it. And like you're saying, that's what it is. And it's so funny. So like my business partner is huge into data. He's like, well, what's, what does the data say? What is it? And like, we have to get the data. It's like bad data in, bad data out. So we always talk about the right data. And you can't just remember it, whether it's if you're in sales or any sort of business. Like, what do the numbers say? And that's all you're doing. That's all baseball is mm-hmm. doing. So it's taking what's been applied in business and software and any sort of development that's been going on and like you said you couldn't remember it all and so it's there for you it's on your dashboard and now it's just someone inside the baseball organization has access to that data can share it with everybody and everyone can be better off for it and so i like what you said like marrying the two things together and i think the media maybe in baseball gets pretty far along with analytics saying how it's ruining the game and all that kind of stuff when actually it and maybe he's helping the game. So, and, and mm-hmm. finding the organizations that probably do the best are the ones that actually, like you just said, marry them together. Not that's yep. so one-sided versus the other. Absolutely, yeah. It's not one or the other. It's, it's how can you marry both? Yeah. Um, and uh, it's funny, people a lot of times, too, will be like, oh, well, there's so many numbers in, in this baseball. And this is what I hear from, especially our college coach at, uh, at Arizona Christian. Uh, he was a 13-year big leaguer. And he played in the 80s and 90s, so he was not around when analytics was a thing. So for me communicating with him, uh, he is always like, well, I, I can't just look at this and make an assumption beam. Like, you're going to have to tell me what it means. Like, I don't freaking know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, for me, it's, uh, there's also a position now, like there's so many numbers, right? But just because you're in baseball, you may not understand this. So uh, you have the analyst guys who are usually math guys. Uh, who are running all these numbers and, and big data. They're making sure that the data is handled correctly. And then you have the coaches, right? But these guys can't really communicate this to the coaches. So there's now there's becoming this other position of people who understand both the game side and both the analytical side. And they take what's being 
uh, done from the analytics side, and they communicate it to the coaches and players in a way that they can understand. Yeah. Uh, essentially, that's where I see my career ending up is one of those guys. Um, if anyone follows uh, – Major League Baseball and knows who Dan Heron is. He had a long career in the big leagues. Sure. Uh, that's his position with the Diamondbacks now. Is he sits in on the analytics meetings and then sits in on the coaches' meetings and communicates what the analytics guys say to the coaches. That's his whole job. That's it. So, uh, yeah, it, it's uh, pretty interesting and uh, pretty cool. Pretty cool where the game's going. No, absolutely. Put it in layman's terms, right? I mean, there's scientific stuff that goes on in all sorts of industries, and you're like, what did that person just say? But then someone mm-hmm. else explains it. Like, you just explain the analytics to, to us. And all of a sudden, like, okay, that makes sense. I can deal with that. You know, and then you kind yep. of move on with it. So, no, Dean, that's awesome. I mean, you have a lot of great things going on. You've experienced all these different things at such a young age. Um, obviously, going to be following you. be rooting for you and uh, to make it um, in the, in, back into the game. And uh, who knows? Maybe you'll come over on the East Coast or the Southeast. Uh, it is very, it's much easier to get to city to city over here. Um, like, yeah. I think <laughs> compared to where you are. So, maybe you should come over to North Carolina. I think of, uh, I think the trouble with the curve, right? So it was about the Atlanta Braves, and then Clint Eastwood, the, act, the actor, had to go to North Carolina to go uh, scout that high school player. Um, so he oh, was I've somewhere. North Carolina, it is beautiful. Yeah. I have a few friends over there. It is yeah. beautiful. I hope to end up there at some point. But, Yo, it's, yeah, it's great. And there's baseball teams everywhere. I mean, it's such a big sport. But I'll say this. You know, um, my son, he's playing soccer now. He loves soccer goalie. But he played a lot of baseball growing up, very young. And I think he, he lo- he's a lefty, so he wants to be a pitcher, always has. And maybe he'll go back to that, whatever he wants to do. But it's, it's, it's wild watching youth sports. And I'm sure you witnessed that uh, growing up and still do in many ways, um, just how much politics and power struggles and overuse of these kids and just over specialization, maybe. I don't know if you agree or disagree on that part of it. But, you know, the future of baseball, uh, you would think it'd be pretty good because football's running into some issues now with injuries. Um, but you know, baseball, it starts at the youth level and when you got to get kids excited about it, interested in it, watching the games, going to the games and saying, and telling their parents, I want to play baseball, right? I mean, do you see a good future mm-hmm. for baseball? Yeah, I see a future that includes a lot more, uh, people from out of the country. Um, there, uh, I don't know how much you know about this, but, uh, the major league baseball has a significant, uh, Latin America, uh, population. So when I was with the Diamondbacks, I would say about half of our players uh, were not from the United States. And if you look at that population-wise, uh, like they were, about half of our players were either Dominican or Puerto Rican or Cuban or, or uh, one of those countries. Um, and if you look at population-wise, uh, like the population of the country compared to the amount of uh, professional baseball players they have, Latin America is dominating percentage-wise. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I think it's just because over there, um, it's not, so it's a, it's a little bit of a, a, a worse situation for them over there. Um, obviously some of the countries are not as developed, uh, there's sure. a lot more poverty. Uh, and basically if you have the talent of getting off, basically to get off the island, like that, that's literally what they call it. Like you get off the island by throwing 95. Like I've heard that many times, uh, from some of my Dominican seniors, um, and essentially, their whole goal, if they are a, a baseball player, is to throw as hard as you possibly can and be as good as you possibly can and sign a professional contract so my family can eat. Like, that's how it's yeah. been described. So it, it, like, has to happen. For those guys. Yep. Yeah, so it has to happen. And then you compare that with our little leagues today, and our little leagues are, you know, focusing on teaching kids. Like, which it's not necessarily a bad thing, but setting it up for professionals that really doesn't set you up that well or teaching the kids how to play the game, or teaching proper mechanics, or, or all these things, or don't throw too hard, that'll happen later, and all this different stuff, right? right, right. But ultimately what happens is uh, these guys from other countries have been training for professional baseball since they were like 10 years old. Yeah. And what we've been doing is, put, like, it, it's just it's just a different, it's not necessarily a good or a bad, it just is. It's different. You know, no, it's just, I, it's how it is. Well, if you, have to, if you have to have something, you're going to have a greater chance of getting it because you're going to do whatever you can possibly do to get that to happen. And yeah, and I, I see it now. Exactly. You know, I see like bad fundamentals being taught. I see focus on winning uh, a game where like the kid sitting at in the, the dugout. At the expense of the kid, yeah. Right, the kid the sits in the, the dugout. Kid, yeah. He had three at-bats where if he would have just showed up to train that day, he could have had 50 at-bats. 
And exactly. I would imagine you'd be a little bit better off. They, they've done a study, even golf, for example. The person that plays golf one weekend, right, one day a week, like on a Saturday, uh, versus the person that just shows up to the driving range for 30 minutes uh, every single day, over the course of time, mm-hmm. will become a better golfer than the person that just plays once a week. Because, like, yeah. yeah, you have to play and you have to apply your skills to something real, like whether it's role playing or whatever you want to call it in business. But, like, in, in, in sports, I see it where it's just like, how many games are we playing this weekend? Now, games are great, but at the same time, like, practice. I see it as soccer a lot of times, like, European, the U- U.S. soccer's. I thought was getting there. The U.S. soccer team doesn't even make the World Cup. But, like, you know, you go to these practices in the U.S. versus what you see or hear about overseas, and it's just completely different. And it's like no wonder that they can't catch up because they're not Mm -hmm. practicing the fundamentals, the skills that you need. It's like basketball too, right? Basketball, these kids are coming from overseas, and they are good at everything. They might not be as tough in certain areas, but they're getting better with it. But they can shoot. They can pass. They can dribble. They can defend, right? It's just it's happening all over the place. So, yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's interesting, uh, to see just basically the, the differences in the, in the two, uh, countries, the way they go about it. And not necessarily that the, the Dominican, uh, or the Latin countries do it better than we do. They just have a different focus. You know, the vast majority of people playing little league are not going to play college baseball. And the vast majority of people playing college baseball are not going to play professional baseball, right. you know? So ultimately it's fine that they don't, uh, if they don't train, like it's just the percentages are just ridiculous, you know, but the vast majority of people in the Dominican, uh, cause there are actually, uh, like camps, like major league camps set up over there to train guys. Vast majority of those guys become professional players. Um, so obviously there's a different, they just start them at an earlier age. Yeah. There's a, obviously it's just a different culture associated with each one. Um, but it is interesting to to see kind of the differences, you know. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, you're you're so well rounded in your knowledge of baseball, and it's it's interesting <laughs> to me. It's interesting to people that listen to it, and you know, a lot of it's the backstory, like you said, get off the island. That's an amazing thing um, that, that that they're trying to do, and just the analytics that you have, and getting back into the game, and just you know, uh, understanding the whole scouts and how all of it works together. So we definitely appreciate you coming on here, spending your time, and, and talking to us about it. This podcast is brought to you by CASCM. CASCM helps you, the entrepreneur, engage with your audience like never before. Most entrepreneurs need help developing business, so that's what we do, business development. We offer you the same techniques that have worked for us. We start with content marketing, which includes storytelling, knowledge sharing, thought leadership, and branding through blogs, podcasts, videos, social media, and personal engagement. This leads to opportunities and relationships for you and your business. What else do you get? A content platform asset that will serve you now and in the future as your industry changes. Why do we do this? Because at CASCM, we love helping entrepreneurs build stuff. We, what we love to do towards the end of our podcast is do like a rapid fire where we haven't talked about any of these questions. They're all easy things for you to answer. So if you don't mind, I'd like to throw some rapid fire questions at you and see what you come up, come back with. Sure, let's do it. All right, cool. So how many hours a day right now are you working out? Am I working out? Yeah. Oh, gosh, very little, very little. Uh, one to two. Very well, is that because of your having the rehab and all the work that you're doing in analytics? Yeah, that's because my arm is currently in a break. Okay. <laughs> so I cannot pick anything up. Can you sit on a bike? <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually, uh, fun fact, I have a very interesting hip structure uh, given to me by my parents. Um, so a bike for me, I try to do as little uh, <laughs> cardio and using my hip joints as possible uh, because they are ticking time bombs. Gotcha. So uh, that's an okay. interesting story about me. But, yeah, uh, one to two, uh, probably closer to one, two on a little heavier days, uh, okay. but not a whole lot currently. Okay. When I'm playing, yeah. somewhere north of three, three yeah. to five every day. Okay, like that. yeah. So you got to put the work in, right? It's not like I always tell our kids. It's like when you go to the game and you see these guys playing, it wasn't like they just showed up here. Like they're working out, like you said, three to five hours a day. And and mm-hmm. in hundred degree in, in Arizona, you imagine in the summer, it's it's not cool there, right? You gotta. Well, I, I have a quick analogy for that, or yeah. a quick thing to kind of help people understand. Um, so, my my mom uh, works in IT, works in web development, things like that, right? My dad is an entrepreneur, right? Uh, some of my professional teammates, uh, their dad was an Olympic gold medalist, and their mom was an Olympic gold medalist. You understand? Like, yeah. <laughs> there's a little bit difference in my genetics compared to some of these other guys. And if your dad and your mom are not decorated, uh, high-level athletes, 
guess what, man? You got to figure it out because you're <laughs> not going to get it naturally. Uh, so for me, um, I, I got, I'm about, I'm about six foot seven and I throw things hard naturally. Um, but majority of the stuff that I've done, I've had to work for, um, uh, because I, genetically, I just don't have it. You know, yeah. I've met a lot of guys who just roll out of bed and they'll throw a lot harder than I do. Um, but their parents were big league players. You know what I'm saying? So yep. it's like, you kind of just have to understand who you are. Not everybody needs to go out and work out. I think that's a big misconception that, you know, a lot of people will say that, oh, you know, hard work beats talent and talent doesn't work hard. You're like, well, you clearly haven't met someone that's talented enough. Right. I've met a lot of guys who are really talented who just have it. And, but they, ultimately, and they can just show up, right? <laughs> they just show up. Yeah, they can. Like, that's, yeah. that's the harsh reality is some people can just show up. Yep. But I don't happen to be one of the guys who can just show up. So yep. for me, i got to be working hard. That's so, yeah. very, very well said. All right, so I'm sure in your time uh, playing baseball, high school, college, and even professionally, what has been your favorite city to travel to for baseball? Mm, Missoula, Montana. Very cool. For sure. Yeah. It's a tight little college town. Uh, there's a river that runs through it. Uh, that's where I uh, spent the majority of my time uh, when I was with the Diamondbacks through the Missoula Osprey. Uh, but I love that place. Very outdoors-based. Uh, I got to get out before it absolutely dumped snow on them because I was only there in the summer. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, with my uh, small amount of uh, time there, uh, I enjoyed the world. Awesome. Well, we love learning about new cities, so we're going to check that one out. All right, so <laughs> with playing sports, there's a lot of downtime. What is your favorite thing to do to kill time? Um, gosh, probably uh, continuing uh, advancing my knowledge on the analytics side. Sure. Um, so especially there's just a bunch of time that you're, you're very correct in saying that there's a lot of downtime, uh, where you could be doing something or you could not be doing something. Um, so for me, um, I've kind of realized the value of doing things that are productive during your downtime. You don't have to kill it during your downtime because I mean, obviously it's still downtime, but just making a little bit of progress in my downtime. And then all of a sudden I look back six months later and I go, wow, I accomplished a lot of things that. I didn't expect to accomplish just by using my downtime, just by having, by basically turning my analytics work into fun, you know, and doing that in my downtime. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of the times I'll, I'll be thinking about different concepts or talking to people about different concepts or different things like that while we're killing time, uh, waiting to get in the game or waiting for the game to start or things like that. Yeah. No, always learning. Can't, can't beat that. Uh, and that's mm-hmm. it's not a, it's not a something you see all the time with a lot of athletes, you know, video games is a big one and you know, that kind of stuff. But, um, like you said, like you're learning, you're, you're working while you're working. So yep. if you, if you weren't working though in baseball, whether it be analytics or playing, what career would you be working in? Uh, most likely, uh, some sort of marketing. Um, I, so I love, uh, like videography, um, I like photography, but I'm not very good at it. I'm much better at videography. Um, so uh, I like producing content, uh, things like that. So I would definitely be somewhere on the content production, uh, digital marketing, yeah. uh, things like that. That's where right. I would be. Well, uh, we lo- yeah. yeah. Well, if you have any free time, we should talk because we love doing, we do our own content marketing. We love it. That's how we found you because we saw your content on, and this is my next question. So maybe follow up to it, but like, what is your favorite uh, social media app to use today? Instagram, by okay. far. So I figured that was going to yeah. be the answer. So the follow-up to that then is you are creating a lot of content. You have an incredible following there. And, I mean, is that just something you just – obviously, you enjoy doing it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you're getting – and yeah. people are learning from you, right? Because you're teaching people how to throw proper pitches and what, what your mindset is when you're on the mound, right? I mean, it's all these different things. It's a – it's a storytelling platform, um, and mm-hmm. obviously, it just seems genuine. It seems to come. It's like it's you, which now makes sense because you said if you weren't working in baseball, you'd be in content. You'd be in some sort of marketing role. You put those two together, and I see it. You're creating content on Instagram, so it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for me, uh, the biggest inspiration for doing something social media wise was when I was younger. Um, again, we kind of hinted on before where I wanted to be a big leaguer, and no one could tell me how to be a big leaguer. Um, I think there's a lot of people out there with that story. You know, I have met so many people where, especially high schoolers, um, who they have the drive to get something done, but they don't know a single person who can help them do what they want to do. And I think that's cute, especially when you're that age. You can't just go and figure it out on your own. Like, it's going to take you a decade to figure it out. Um, So I think what my role is for a majority of these uh, younger people, high school, college, even uh, I have a lot of professional guys that follow me as well. 
is just kind of for them to be like, okay, what does this guy do? What has he learned? And what can I learn from this guy? You know, essentially, I just put ideas into their heads and uh, I show them what I do and what I'm working on and what I'm interested in. And uh, hopefully it sparks some inspiration. Excuse me. Hopefully it sparks some inspiration for them uh, to uh, continue advancing their own career. You know? Yeah, no, I get it. All right. So pick one. Read a book or read on a Kindle? Oh, gosh. Uh, probably Kindle. Kindle. Okay. Now, if you had the choice of reading a blog or listening to a podcast? Oh, listening, 100%. Uh, uh, I, uh, I don't focus very well. Uh, so, uh, well, I don't focus reading very well. So listening, I'm a much better visual hearing than I am, uh, than I am reading. So okay. definitely podcast. Okay. So this question I'm just kind of coming off with, coming up with because I, I did this yesterday. So I'm just curious as to what other people think. It's kind of random. We have two more questions. So you walk into uh, a restaurant, you walk into a restaurant, you have a bar where you can sit at and you have a table you can sit at. Which one do you choose? Oh gosh. Probably the table. Very, very okay. quick answer, table. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. All I, right, so uh, you're in professional sports, but you might you might have one that you can answer to. If you could only pick one team to cheer for as a fan in all of professional sports or college sports, what team would that be? The Astros. The Houston yeah. Astros. Oh gosh, wow. so yep. there you go. <laughs> I think they are uh I think they're very, very uh, and yes, they won the World Series this last year, but yeah. I think they're very dedicated towards finding ways to do things correctly or not necessarily correctly, but finding different ways to make their guys better. Uh, I think they are just the most invested in terms of uh, their players and in terms of uh, chasing success and just hungrily searching for the next, the next thing to do and continue to get better. So uh, I like how the, I like the direction of the organization and uh, it's no surprise to me that they've, become a, an MLB powerhouse. It's no surprise it, based on their approach. It was unbelievable. Yeah, I remember like five or so years ago maybe, and they you started terrible. to read, but you started reading yep. about what they had started to do, and you're like, uh-huh. this is going to be a team in the future, and people are like, no, that's crazy. And like like you said, even last year, that they kind of fell off at the end of the year, but they uh-huh. were, they were. I mean, I, I'm an Indians fan, so I remember watching, I was like, oh, the Astros, they're going to be the team, and then the Indians just made their jump. The Astros kind of fell off a little bit, and then this year it was like, they they had a good year this year too. Fell off a little bit, but then made their run and uh, got it done. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. So definitely the Astros on that. Indians are not far behind. Yeah, um, yeah, they're not far behind. So uh, but they yeah. had a two both, they both had a two year run though. I mean the one when they lost to the Cubs that's a little bit heartbreaking. And then um, this past year I knew it. I just they were so good. Had that twenty two game winning streak, and you just mm-hmm. it's almost like the teams that are that good don't win it like when they were just that dominant for so long that it was just like it just had a bad matchup i think with the yankees in the first <laughs> round man <laughs> yeah but oh, yeah. they'll be back again this year they'll be good but there's a lot astros will be back yankees will be back i'm sure so diamondbacks were a good team uh, good organization that they've done a lot of good things they said the dodgers right i mean the dodgers have been mm-hmm. kind of dominant so oh yeah dodgers are very good well, Dean, it yep. has been absolutely awesome having you because you just, like I said before, you just you bring a, a, a different a different perspective. Uh, you've been through a lot at a young age, have a lot of great things going. I've said this before. We'll be watching you. Check. Uh, let's absolutely stay in touch. Maybe talk about some marketing, Instagram. It's always fun to do. So definitely appreciate the time you spent with us and uh, the personal stories that you brought to us today. Uh, so thank you for your time and being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I love getting to talk to you guys. So yeah, and we'll ap- yeah, and we'll we'll put everything in the show notes because you're on Instagram, right? What is uh, real quick? What is uh, your Instagram name to, so everyone can find you? Okay, so my Instagram name is at double X can flex. So D O U B L E X C A N F L E X. Awesome. That is my Instagram name. Well, yeah, we're, sorry, we're, it's so complicated. No, it's, it's easy. We'll we'll create a link. So all you got to do is go to the show notes, click the link, and you'll see all your good content there. So once again, <laughs> Dean, thank you again. Absolutely. Dean, it was absolutely awesome having you on this podcast. From the experience you bring in the professional sports world to your journey on and off the field, we are all better off for taking some time to learn from you. The perspectives from Dean on learning from any situation to being a constant learner in his business are now perspectives you as a business owner and entrepreneur can use for yourself. And for that, Dean, thank you. And for any entrepreneur with questions on all things baseball and analytics, feel free to reach out to Dean. 
If you have questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. You can contact me on Twitter at Eric underscore Kaz or with the same name on Instagram, or you can find us at KazSource.com with links to us on the different social networks. Thank you for listening to our CadSource podcast, Entrepreneur Perspectives, building and protecting your business one podcast at a time. Until next time, we're out of here. This podcast exists in large part because of CADCM, the content marketing business inside CADSource, Inc. CADCM is excited to bring the content marketing services used at CADSource to you. Learn more by visiting CADCM.com. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. It's a big deal to us. We hope you found value in it. And if you did, we would be incredibly grateful if you gave us a review on iTunes. Remember to subscribe to this podcast and feel free to share it with anyone you know. More than anything, thank you again for listening. We appreciate it.